Father in heaven, we thank you for the lamb that was slain. We thank you for that new and living way that has been opened for us, whereby we can come to your throne in, 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 in boldness to find grace to help in time of need. And Father, our greatest need we've seen is revival, which comes through an understanding of the books of Daniel and Revelation. And so, Father, we pray for your spirit to give us guidance in your word, to guide us into all truth, and to bring things to our remembrance of that which we have learned. Guide us now as we study your word in Jesus' name. Amen. Welcome back. <clears throat> I was at the last slide on the last presentation, and because of my infamiliarity uh, with PowerPoint, I didn't realize it, and I, uh, if I would have moved a little quicker, we would have got through that, but we'll go back and look at that. In, in uh, summary of what we looked at last time, though, what I was trying to suggest to us is that when it comes to teaching the message, we should be able to portray the message in the terms of the great controversy and uh, show from history and prophecy how the great controversy has impacted um, history and prophecy from the beginning of time to the end of time. And one of the, the symbols of the great controversy in Bible prophecy is Michael, and when we find Michael, um, he's always in confrontation with Satan, whether it's in Revelation 12, Jude, or in Daniel's last vision. And we touched upon that, and, and we hopefully will hit this some more, that in Daniel's last vision we see Daniel being used to symbolize Adventism both at the beginning and the end. And then <clears throat> I tried to take up uh, some of the symbols that we need to come to grips with as we move into a closer study of Daniel 11, uh, that one symbol that we touched on a little bit is that the enemy of God's people that the prophets were portraying when they were dealing with the end of the world was an enemy that comes out of the north. Um, it's the enemy that's symbolized by Babylon and sometimes by Assyria, which is a type of Babylon. And um, it's an enemy who is a king of kings, little king, bringing with it the truth of the Bible of Satan's desire to set himself upon the throne and to personate Christ and set in his place. And a rule that we developed early on was, or at least discussed, I don't know if we developed it, was the rule of first and last. Um, Jesus being the first and last, you will find in God's word that when a topic is introduced into the Bible the first time, that is the most important and complete time that that topic is addressed. The, the second most important time you will find that topic is the last time it's addressed. And the times that that topic may be addressed in the middle of the first and last, they add information um, to the story of that topic, but they never change the initial introduction. Classic example that we're all familiar with is Genesis 3.15, very simple verse. But Genesis 3.15 contains all the elements of the everlasting gospel. And throughout the Bible, the, those elements are broadened and expanded, but there's no new uh, specific information. And this is just one illustration of the first and last. Another illustration of first and last, if you're not following what I'm saying, is um, the first time that, that Babylon is introduced in the Bible. In Genesis 10 and 11, there's many characteristics there, but I'll just point to two so um, you can follow my point. Uh, in the story of Babel and Nimrod, um, two of the things that took place in that story that you're familiar with is that they built a city and a tower. And we've already looked at and given references for um, the truth that in the Bible, a city symbolizes a kingdom, a geopolitical kingdom, and a tower in Bible prophecy symbolizes a church. So the first time that Babylon, under the terminology of Babel, is introduced in the scriptures in Genesis 10 and 11, one of the things it teaches is that the story of Babylon is the story of the combination of church and state. Everything about Babylon, there's more in there, but I just want you to, to see that 
uh, first time something's introduced in Scripture um, is the most important. It contains the whole story, even if it's symbolized and abbreviated. And then, uh, if you're familiar with Louis Weir, um, he brings this rule out very soundly, establishes it, you know, from a lot of different directions, but also uh, different Bible writers. You can see this rule incorporated into their individual testimonies, and it is incorporated into the book of Daniel, because um, we see the story of Daniel here uh, up on the screen uh, begins in verses 1 and 2 of chapter 1, and it says, In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, Jehoiakim, king of Judah, came Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, unto Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand with parts of the vessels of the house of God, which he carried into the land of Shinar, to the house of his God, and he brought the vessels into the treasure house of his God. Daniel's story opens with Babylon attacking Jerusalem and prevailing and coming into Jerusalem and winning the battle. But Daniel's story ends in verse 45 where it says, And he, the king of the north, Babylon, modern Babylon, he shall plant the tabernacles of his palaces, palace between the seas and the glorious holy mountain. Yet he shall come to his end and none shall help. This is portraying modern Babylon attempting to conquer modern Israel, and this time he does not prevail. And this is the basic beginning and end of the book of Daniel. I realize that after verse 45 you have Daniel 12, um, but this is the prophetic testimony. Daniel, Dan, Daniel 12 is a, an epilogue to the entire testimony. We see the, in the first and the last in Daniel um, the two stories, and it's, and it's by looking at this that you also can help establish that the king of the north here in verse 45, that it's going to be the king of Babylon that comes to its end. There is, it doesn't seem to be much modern argument against the king of the north in verse 45 being the papacy. In Advent history, there's been much argument about that, uh, but there are different arguments about the last six verses of Daniel 11 that go on in Adventism today. But I'm, I'm not really aware of anyone that's bringing a valid and well-known argument on those verses that is teaching that the King of the North in those last six verses is not the papacy. Even with all the various views, I think everyone is, is unwilling to argue the fact that it's the papacy. But in any case, to establish this, this is also a point of reference um, for that truth. Uh, that is the conclusion of part one, and we are now moving into part two. And uh, I'm finding it, my apologies. Uh, Sister White says you're not supposed to apologize from up front, but I remembered it after I apologized. Uh, not supposed to waste the time with apologies, she says. Um, I've never worked through these studies on PowerPoint. D Daniel 8, what we're going to look at here, it, I, it's very familiar with, for me to just take the Bible and work through it. Um, so I'm, I may have to go to, this may be, this be unfamiliar ground for me to be trying to work through this step-by-step -step, um, approach. But it, we're looking at Daniel chapter 8, if you'd turn there with me. For me, in, in my study of Daniel's last vision and my understanding of some of the arguments of Daniel's last vision, uh, there are probably five, five different arguments, I'll, I'll say that, within the study of Daniel 11 that deal with words. And f just to tell you what they are so you, you follow me is, there's an argument about why isn't the glorious land and the glorious holy mountain the same thing? Don't they both say glorious? Doesn't that make them the same? And I'd submit to you that the fact that Daniel says glorious holy mountain here and glorious land over here is Daniel saying, hey, they're different. But some people want to say because they both have glorious on them that they're the same entity. So with the word glorious, there's a being used twice, there's an argument about that. Set that one aside. In Daniel 8, there's two words that are translated sanctuary. Uh, one of those words is only used in God's word to identify God's sanctuary, period. Whether it's his sanctuary on earth or his sanctuary in heaven, that word sanctuary is only used for God's sanctuary. Where the other word 
in Daniel 8 that's translated as sanctuary is sometimes God's sanctuary and sometimes it's a pagan sanctuary. So you, there's, a, there's something to understand about those two words. And then there's two words that are translated as take away. And uh, the two words that are translated as take away in Daniel 11 and Daniel 12, um, sir, is different than the word room in Daniel 8 that's translated as, say, as take away. So you, got, you need to come to grips with take away, sanctuary, glorious land, glorious holy mountain. Uh, but another word, the one we're going to take up here, is vision. In Daniel chapter 8, um, you will find, if you read through Daniel chapter 8 in the King James Version, you'll find, that the, word, you'll find the word vision ten times. And this is from two different Hebrew words, and you can see these words on the screen. And I realize that uh, if you're going to be correct, uh, in the, the spelling of these words that this first word, mare, and I'm probably pronouncing that wrong. I, don't, I personally, I won't say that. But there is a little um, pronunciation mark in the middle of mare. I think it's after the R or after the A. But it is impertinent to our studies. But I'm letting you know, I know it goes there. But I don't know how to put that particular pronunciation mark on the computer, so it's not there. And the second word that is translated as vision in Daniel 8, kazon, chazon, uh, correct me if you know the correct Hebrew pronunciation. Uh, they're both translated vision, but they mean two different things. Um, there are two words translated as vision in Daniel chapter 8. One means the entire vision, one means snapshot, and that's my word, snapshot, but it means the a brief view, one entire view. And brothers and sisters, how you understand these two words has an impact on verse 13. Verse 13 of Daniel 8. Then I heard one saint speaking, and another saint said unto that certain saint which spake, How long shall be the vision concerning the daily sacrifice and the transgression of desolation to give both the sanctuary and the host to be trodden underfoot? Uh, this word here, um, Kazon, Chazon, means the entire vision. It means the entire vision of Daniel chapter 8. Now tell me, how important would this question be? The very foundation of Adventism is the answer to this question. So if we're going to understand the answer to the question, we better understand the question. And the question is, how long is the vision that begins in the time period of the Medes and the Persians Go, carries on through Greece, carries on through pagan Rome, and carries on into papal, papal Rome. Um, if you think it's a snapshot vision and it's just one brief view, um, you're not understanding the intent of the question. It's asking how long is this vision that starts back there in the time period of the Medes and the Persians. You need to be specific on this word here if you're going to understand the question in order to understand the answer. And brothers and sisters in Adventism today, they're not specific on this word. Uh, one of the things that goes on is they try to apply the definition of mare to chazon in this particular verse because they want to emphasize the end of the vision. They don't mind emphasizing the end of the vision to try to uphold their far, false view of the daily, but they certainly don't want to understand, uh, emphasize the duration of the 2300 years because if you're going to emphasize the duration of the 2300 years, I'll try to keep this simple. This isn't really where I'm going with this, but maybe this is simple enough for everyone to follow. If you believe that the daily is the work of Christ in the heavenly sanctuary, then usually, usually, historians will say that the earliest point in history that you can say that, uh, that Catholicism introduced the false uh, mass, which blocked and obscured the work of Christ in the, in the sanctuary above, and that's, that's the story with the daily. Usually, they'll say the third or fourth century. Recently, uh, Elder Bacchiochi, said that the papal primacy was established in the second century, okay? So that, that would be when the daily arrived, obscured or removed Christ's work in the sanctuary, if you're going to buy into Conradi's view of the daily that came into Adventism in 1901. So, so with that in mind, if the question is, is how long is the vision concerning the daily, and you believe the daily, the, the farthest you can go back into history is the second century, even if you give back Yoki the benefit of the doubt, then the question is, 
How long is the vision that began in the second century? Hmm. And if that's the case, what happens to 1844? It's gone. It's not, it doesn't come to pass till 2500. And it's all based upon this word, vision. How long is the vision concerning the daily? Now, if you believe as the pioneers did that the daily represented paganism, then the vision that began in Daniel 8, that begins in the Medes and the Persians, well, that vision began in the time periods of the Medes and the Persians. And what took place in the time period of the Medes and Persians? The three decrees. Wow, you're right in the identical history that the pioneers were at that started the 2300 days prophecy. And then the answer is sound. So, so these words vision, th this word vision has an impact on a lot of things. I'm not trying to deal with that point at this point. I'm just trying to let you know that how we deal with the words in Daniel chapter 8 mean a great deal, particularly words that are kind of, have kind of been hidden uh, by the translators. But in any case, in verse 26, we see both of these words. It says, And the vision of the evening and morning which was told is true, wherefore shut up the vision, for it shall be for many days. Both of these words are in verse 26. The first word that's translated as vision, the one that is the snapshot vision, is the vision of the evenings and mornings. Now, when in verse 26 it says evening and morning, where does that come from? We're all well-trained Seventh-day Adventists. Oh, yeah, it comes from Genesis, but where does it come from, from in Daniel 8? In, in, in verse 14, where it says 2,300 uh, evenings, uh, uh, 2300 days, the, the Hebrew there is 2300 evenings and mornings. The translators made it 2300 days, but this is the same phrase in verse 26 as in verse 14. And the point is this this vision that is the snapshot vision is the vision of the 2300 days. It says in verse 26, and the vision of the 2300 days which was told is true, wherefore shut up the entire vision. This is the other word. This is the complete vision. Daniel, shut up the vision that begins in the Medes and the Persians and goes until 1844. Close up the whole thing. But while you're closing up the whole thing, I want you to realize that the vision of the 2300 days is true. Okay, so there's the distinction between those two words in one verse, all right? Now, if you go up to... Um, verse 15. It says, And it came to pass when I, even I, Daniel, had seen the vision. And this is the snapshot vision. So what's he speaking of here? Based on verse 26. When he'd seen the snapshot vision, vision he's talking about the 2300 day vision. He says, and it came to pass when I, even I, had seen the snapshot vision, the, the 2300 day vision, and sought for the meaning, then behold, there stood before me as the appearance of a man. And I heard a man's voice between the banks of Uli, which called and said, Gabriel, make this man to understand the vision, the snapshot vision. Gabriel wasn't asked to make him understand the complete vision. This is mare, make him understand the snapshot vision, make him understand the vision of the 2300 days. Do you follow my emphasis? I think I'm not uh, um, following my notes. Verse 15 and 16, this is the snapshot vision based on the word mare that is translated as vision. And Here's the point I want you to see, and I hope that the, the confusion of my inability to put this on PowerPoint correctly and our just finishing lunch doesn't allow us not to get this point. Okay? Here's the point. Inspiration purposely sets forth this whole story here. And it commands Gabriel to make Daniel understand the 2300 day vision okay so i want you to watch something verse 17 Dan gabriel's been given a command make him understand the snapshot vision the 2300 day vision so he came near where i stood and when he came i was afraid and fell upon my face and he and he said unto me understand o son of man 
For at the time of the end shall be the vision, snapshot vision. Now you think about it. How many of you have ever given a Bible study on the 2300 days? I hope every hand goes up. <laughs> you don't do it in one, time, one setting, do you? I mean, you're going to go through the sanctuary. If you've got a lot of time, you're going to go through the sanctuary. You're going to go through the furnishings of the sanctuaries. You're going to go through the feast days connected with the sanctuary. You're going to go all the way back to the Garden of Eden. You're going to spend a lot of time on the study of a sanctuary, right? And then ultimately, you're going to get to the part where the sanctuary is cleansed, right? So Daniel sees the snapshot vision. He sees the vision of the 2300 days. And then an angel, Gabriel, the highest angel, is sent with the command. Gabriel, make him understand this vision. And what does Gabriel tell him? Does he tell him about the Day of Atonement? Does he tell him about the feast days? Does he tell him about the furnishing? What does he tell him? After he's been commanded to make him know about the 2300 day prophecy, what does he tell him? He says, at the time of the end shall be the vision. At the time of the end should be the vision. What's that got to do with October 22nd, 1844? That's all he tells him. Gabriel was commanded to make him understand the vision, and all he had to say to Daniel was, at the time of the end shall be the vision. That's it. That's it. And then let's read on. Now as I was speaking with me, I was in a deep sleep on my face toward the ground, but he touched me and set me upright. And he said, Behold, I will make thee know what will be in the last end of the, indig the, ig of the indignation, for at the time of the appointed, the end shall be. Brothers and sisters, the only thing that Gabriel tells him about the 2300-day vision, and I'm purposely overemphasizing this to try to make sure it sticks in our minds, the only thing that Gabriel told him after he was commanded to make him understand about this vision was that at the time of the end, which is the end, which is the time appointed, the vision shall be. That's it. The only thing we were to understand in this chapter, is that on October 22nd, 1844, prophetically, that was the time of the end. It was the time appointed. It was the end. Think about it. I mean, we, we, it's, it's inspiration. It was recorded purposely. It was recorded that Gabriel was commanded to make him understand that. And the only thing he taught Daniel was, the vision is at the time of the end. And if the time of the end is the vision, and it's the time of the pointed, and it's the end, you see my, my reasoning up here. If A equals B and B equals C, then C equals A. If the time of pointed is the end, and the end is the time of the end, then the time of the end is the time of pointed. And I'm submitting to you that the only thing that Gabriel came to teach Daniel about the 2300-day prophecy in Daniel 8, the very foundational chapter of Adventism, the very foundational verse of Adventism, the only thing Gabriel came to teach him is that when the 2300-day prophecy reached its conclusion, that we were to understand that prophetically that is called the time of the end. That's all he wanted to teach him. And upon the testimony of two or three, a thing shall be established. Daniel 11, verse 24. Many Seventh-day Adventists don't understand this, work, this verse any longer, but the pioneers understood this verse. If you're unfamiliar with this verse, what I'm going to say to you about this verse, you can read in Haskell or Uriah Smith or some of the other pioneers. This is standard foundational understanding that I'm going to share here about verse 24. Verse 24 is dealing with pagan Rome. It says, He, sh pagan Rome, shall enter peaceably uh, even upon the fattest places of the province, and he shall do that which his fathers have not done, nor his father's fathers. He shall scatter among them the prey and spoil and riches, Yea, he shall forecast his advices against the strongholds even for a time. The pioneers will correctly tell you the last couple verse, phrases of that verse, that it's saying uh, that the word against translated in the, this verse is sometimes in the Bible translated from, and the pioneers and, and some Bible commentaries agreeing with the pioneers say that the best translation for the last part of this verse 
is that pagan Rome would broadcast its devices from its stronghold even for a time. The pioneers would go on to tell you that the stronghold of pagan Rome was the city of Rome and that this verse is saying that pagan Rome would broadcast its authority over its kingdom, the kingdom of pagan Rome, from its stronghold, the city of Rome, for a time. What's a time? It's a time prophecy. There was a time prophecy on how long pagan Rome was going to rule the world. Um, this is from Uriah Smith. The latter portion of this verse, Bishop Newton gives the idea of forecasting devices from strongholds instead of against them. This the Romans did from the strong fortress of their seven-hilled city, even for a time, doubtless a prophetic time, 360 years. From what point are these years to be dated? Probably from the event brought to view in the following verse. And then Uriah Smith goes on, and he tells us that pagan Rome ruled the world supremely from the Battle of Actium in B.C. 31. He says, the battle was fought September 2nd, B.C. 31 at the mouth of the Gulf of Abrasia near the city of Actium. The world was at stake. The world was the stake for these stern warriors. Anthony and Caesar now played. The contest, long doubtful, was at length decided by the course which Cleopatra pursued, for she, frightened at the din of battle, took flight when there was no danger and drew, her, drew after her the whole Egyptian fleet. I cut a lot out of that because what I want us to see is that the pioneers understood that verse 24 was identifying a time prophecy for how long pagan Rome would rule the world. It began in 31 BC, and the history that that battle took place in was the history of Antony and Cleopatra and, and Caesar. In a history that's well documented, that we've all heard about. So, what am I saying? I'm saying that there was a time prophecy for how long pagan Rome ruled the world, and there was a time prophecy for how long papal Rome ruled the world. But as the chapter uh, continues, um, we, need to under, we need to identify, partially for future um, reference, when the time prophecy began. Now, we already identified when it began. When did it begin? 31 BC. That's when pagan Rome ruled the world supremely, but there, there was something that had to take place before pagan Rome would rule the world supremely. And if you turn to Ch Daniel chapter 8, verse 9, inspiration tells us what has to take place for pagan Rome to rule the world supremely. Um, we will deal with chapter 8 a little bit more in depth, but the, the book that we handed out to all of you called The Mystery of the Daily by John Peters, this covers this passage very well. But in verse 9, it says, Out of one of them came forth a little horn. This little horn is pagan Rome in both, it's Rome in both its fa phases, but primarily here it's dealing with pagan Rome. And it says that the little horn, which waxed exceeding great toward the south, toward the east, and toward the pleasant land. In order for pagan Rome to conquer the world and rule it supremely, it had to overcome three geographical areas. Syria, Palestine, and Egypt. And the third geographical area was conquered by pagan Rome in 31 BC, and from that point on, pagan Rome ruled the world supremely for 360 years. Now, if you drop back, if you go back to Daniel 11, and you drop into verses 27 and 29, it says, And both these kings' hearts shall be to do mischief, and they shall speak lies at one table, but it shall not prosper, for yet the end shall be at the time appointed. This is still pagan Rome, and this is dealing with the history of this 360-year time period that pagan Rome would rule the world. It's talking about when this time period that pagan Rome would rule the world would come to an end. Continuing on, it says, Then shall he return into his land with great riches, and his heart shall be against the holy covenant, and he shall do ex exploits and return to his own land. And at the time appointed, he shall return and come toward the south, but it shall not be as the former or the latter. And what I'm suggesting to you here is that this end and this time appointed that is mentioned in these verses is the end of the 
360-year time period that pagan Rome would rule the world. You see, in the book of Daniel, when Daniel is identifying when a time prophecy comes to a conclusion, Daniel uses three phrases to identify that. The time of the end, that means it's the end of a time prophecy, or the time appointed, that means it's the end of a time prophecy, or the end, it means it's the end of a time prophecy. That was what was established in Daniel 8. What was the time prophecy in Daniel 8? It was the 2300 year time prophecy. In the 2300 year time prophecy, it was very important for Gabriel. The only thing he wanted to teach Daniel about the 2300 year time prophecy is that when it reached fulfillment, that prophetically it's called the time of the end, the time appointed, or the end. And here we have a second time prophecy in the book of Daniel, and Daniel once again is teaching us that the end of that time prophecy is prophetically called the end or the time appointed. This is Uriah Smith speaking of these verses. The time appointed is probably the prophetic time of verse 24. They understood it. They understood that Daniel there is referring to the conclusion of this 360 year time prophecy, which has been previously mentioned. It closed as already shown in AD 330. The removal of the seat of the empire to Constantinople was the signal for the downfall of the empire. Rome then lost its pre prestige. The western division was exposed to the incursions of foreign enemies. On the death of Constantine, the Roman Empire was divided into three parts. How many knew that? How many knew? How many know the, the there's, I know there's some in here. Usually there isn't. How many, how many divisions does the Roman Empire go into? First, it divides in east and west. When? When Constantine moves the capital from Rome to Constantinople, suddenly the Roman Empire is divided into east and west. And then there's a, a threefold division in both east and west. What was the threefold division in eastern Rome? It was when Constantine divided it up three ways between his three sons. We're going to read about it in a minute. I don't remember their names. It was like Constance, Constantine II, and they're all constants of some time. But what was the threefold division in western Rome? What was the threefold division in western Rome? It was their government. Their, their Caesar, their, their, what are they called? The Senate and the, the proconsul. You know why that's important? Because when you're dealing with the trumpets, the first four trumpets, and it's talking about the kingdoms being, a third of the trees being burned up, uh, it, you read the trumpets, it's talking about a third, a third, a third over and over, and you'll find that the pioneers understood those thirds to be the, 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 defining which third of the kingdom was going down under that part of the trumpet. But in any case, Rome's divided into east and west, then it's divided into three, three, but then how's it divided? Into ten, right? Into ten. And then the next one isn't really a division, it's a subtraction. What's the subtraction? Three, and then what's the next one? An, an addition, right? Well, anyway, they're right here. On the death of Constantine, the Roman Empire was divided into three parts between his three sons, Constantius, Constantine II, and Constans. Constantine was a very creative thinker, wasn't he? The barbarians of the north now began their incursions. As soon as the capital of the empire was moved from Rome to Constantinople, the barbarians start to take the kingdom apart. What is this? What is this? It's the trumpets of Revelation begin to blow. The books of Daniel and Revelation are connecting right here. This is what starts taking the kingdom apart. If we're going to understand the disintegration of the Roman Empire in the book of Daniel, we have to incorporate into it the history and Revelation that adds to that. Um, and notice the last part of Uriah Smith's quote, and to this the fatal step of removing the seat of the empire from Rome to Constantinople directly led. Pioneers understood that when they moved the capital, that was the end. Now, what am I saying? I'm saying in the mouth of two or three witnesses, a thing shall be established. And two times in the book of Daniel, it is established that at the end of a time prophecy, that is the time of the end or the time appointed or the end. Very simple. Verse 31 of Daniel 11. An arm shall stand on his part, and they shall pollute the sanctuary of strength, and shall take away the daily sacrifice, and they shall place the abomination 
that make it desolate. Brothers and sisters, I haven't found anyone yet that's willing to argue that the abomination that make it desolate here in verse 31 is not the papacy. We all agree that this is the papacy. Okay, this verse 31 is identifying when the papacy is placed in power. It's, it's describing some of the dynamics to the placing of the papacy in the, the first few phrases, but when you see the abom- they shall place the abomination that make it desolate, that's 538. That's the beginning of the 1260 years. And then what happens? The verses, uh, this is, this is uh, Uriah Smith commenting, and they shall place the abomination that make it desolate, having shown quite fully what constituted the taking away of the daily or paganism. We now inquire, when was the abomination that make it desolate or the papacy placed or set up? The little horn that had eyes like the eyes of a man was not, to sl- not slow to see when the way was open for his advancement and elevation. From the year 508, his progress towards universal supremacy was without parallel. Why? Why was it without parallel from 508? Because after 508, the seven European kings had all bowed down to Rome, and he was fully using their armies. The way was open. There was other things that happened, but there wasn't any military resistance in the kingdom from those seven kings. Um, the whole nation of the Ostrogoths had been assembled for the siege of Rome, but success did not attend their efforts. Their hosts melted away in frequent and bloody combats under the city walls, and the year and nine days during which the siege lasted witnessed almost the entire consumption of the whole nation. In the month of March, 538, dangers beginning to threaten them from other quarters, they raised the siege, burned their tents, and retired into tumult and confusion from the city with numbers scarcely sufficient to preserve their existence as a nation or their identity as a people. Thus the Gothic horn, the last of the three, was plucked up before the little horn of Daniel 7. Nothing now stood in the way of the Pope to prevent his exercising the power conferred upon him by Justinian five years before. Now this is 538. This is March of 538. The last of the three horns has been removed and Uriah Smith said there was something confirmed on the Pope five years before by Justinian. What was that? That was Revelation 13.2. Revelation 13.2 says pagan Rome will give papal Rome three things, power, seat, and authority. And in the year 533, Justinian gave his civil authority over to the Pope of Rome by making him the head of the churches and the corrector of heretics. Now, he, he waited for five years to exercise that authority till the last of the horn was removed, was taken away, but... It's all part of the process. It's all part of the story. Um, So, moving on down through verse 31 and onward. Verse 31, the placing of the abomination that make it desolate is the papacy in the year 538, March of 538, if we want to be real specific. And then verse 32 says this. This is when the papacy takes control of the earth. And such as do wickedly against the covenant shall he corrupt by flatteries, but the people that do know their God shall be strong and do exploits. And they that understand among the people shall instruct many, yet they shall fall by the sword and by flame and by captive, captivity and by spoil many days. What are we being told here? We're told as soon as the papacy takes control of the world, the persecution begins, right? And how long is the persecution going to last? Does it say it in the verse? It says many days. Many days. Is this many days, the 1260 years? Certainly. Matthew 24, 22. Jesus said, And except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. Sister White commenting on this, and she comments on this in more than one place. She says, In the Savior's conversation with his disciples upon all of it, after describing the long period of trial for the church, the 1260 years of papal persecution, concerning which he had promised the tribulation should be shortened, he thus mentioned certain events to precede his coming and fixed the time when the first of these should be witnessed. In those days, after the tribulation, the sun shall be darkened and the moon shall not give her light. Mark 13, 24. The 1260 days or years terminated in 1798. A quarter of a century earlier, persecution had almost wholly ceased. Brothers and sisters, Jesus referred to the 1260 years as those days 
And here in Daniel 11, the many days of persecution, that's just another way of saying the 1260 years of papal persecution. The pre two verses before is when the papacy is set. Those days by context is the 1260 years of papal persecution. And in Desire of Ages, Sister White comments on this some more. From the destruction of Jerusalem, Christ passed on rapidly to the greater event, the last link in the chain of this earth's history, the coming of the Son of God in majesty and glory. Between these two events, there lay open to Christ's view long centuries of darkness, centuries for his church marked with blood and tears and agony. Upon these scenes, his disciples could not then endure to look, and Jesus passed them by with a brief mention. Then shall be great tribulation, he said, such as not was not since the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor ever shall be, and except those days should be shortened. Those days are the period that the papacy persecuted God's people. Now, continuing on in Daniel eleven thirty one and onward, it says, Now when they shall fall, verse 34, Now when they shall fall, they shall be hoping with little help, but many shall cleave to them with flatteries, and some of them of understanding shall fall to try them and to purge them and to make them white even to the time of the end, because it's yet for the time appointed. What's the time of the end in the book of Daniel? It's, no, in the book of Daniel, what's the time of the end? Nope. It can be, you, can give, you can give me f four good answers, probably. The, the time of the end is the time appointed. Or you can say the time of the end and the time of the appointed is the end. But if we're going to get specific about the definition in the book of Daniel, what is the time of the end? It's an, the end of a time prophecy. In Daniel chapter 8, it's the end of the 2300 year time prophecy. In Daniel 11 verse 24 through 20. Nine, it's the end of the 360-year time prophecy of how long pagan Rome would rule the world. In this passage, we're dealing with who? The papacy. We're the many days of persecution of the papacy. So here in this verse, when it says the persecution goes until the time of the end because it's yet for a time appointed, in the context of that verse, then you could say the time of the end is 1798. But technically, prophetically, in the book of Daniel, the time of the end, in the general sense, is the end of a time prophecy. This time prophecy is the time prophecy of papal rule. Follow me? This, this seems, may seem simple. It may seem simple, it may seem irrelevant, but brothers and sisters, if you're going to go out and, and really nail down the last six verses of Daniel 11, this does it. This does it because this, in the book of Daniel, nails down verse 40. You don't have to get in the spirit of prophecy. And anyone can usually see this. Daniel 11 verse 40 says, And at the time of the end, what's the time of the end here? It has to be 1798. There has been no change in subject from verse 31 to verse 40. Now, there's some that say there is. Uriah Smith said there was. He said in verse 36 there was a change of subject. And you know what? He's wrong. And, and his change of subject, he made some predictions that they're, they're so out there, nobody tries to defend them any longer. I mean, some people do, but... This is, the, this is the, the time of the end of the subject that be, was introduced in verse 31. It's 1798, the conclusion of the 1260-year time prophecy, and it's straight from the book of Daniel. 1798, it says. Now, you follow my reasoning here, okay? Because I want to ask you a question. <laughs> Everybody, when you come to verse 40, it says, and at the time of the end, as a student of prophecy, based on the book of Daniel, what do you have to determine? You have to determine what time prophecy is under discussion, right? So you're going to have to go back in and see who's the subject. And you go back up to verse 31, and you see the subject is the papacy. 
So is there time prophecy connected with the papacy? 1260 years. So this is 1798. So what happened in 1798? Berthier, Berthier took the Pope captive. Is that, is that what happened in 1798? In verse 40, it's saying, at the time of the end in 1798, shall the king of the south push at the papacy, because it's the same subject, and the word push means to war against. So, without do, jumping through any hoops, if verse 40 is identifying 1798, and it's identifying when the, a war began against the papacy in 1798, then... Who's the king of the south? It's got to be France. It's got to be France. It was France that began this war. Atheistic France. When you get a little bit deeper, you will start emphasizing atheistic France. But brothers and sisters, this is easy. This is easy. I mean, I may be making it look hard, but this is very simple information. The king of the north, we've, we could go back and do some more on. We're going to. But once you understand the time of the end, by the context of that phrase, it has to be the end of a time prophecy and the papacy is under discussion. It has to be the end of the time prophecy dealing with the papacy. And therefore, if somebody began a war with the papacy, when that time prophecy came to a conclusion, verse 40 says that, per, that power that began the war was the king of the south. Therefore, the king of the south is the power that history says attacked the papacy in 1798 and it's atheistic France, period. This same reasoning says that Save it for the question and answer. You're probably right. Go back to verse 36. <coughs> the, are, the one argument in, in the history of Adventism that says that this king of the north in verse 40 may not be the papacy is introduced by Uriah Smith, and he, he, he jumps off on verse 36. He agrees that in verse 35, from verse 31 to verse 35, Uriah Smith agrees wholeheartedly that the power under discussion is the papacy. And then we come to verse 36, and it says, The king, and the king, the king, shall do according to his will, and he shall exalt himself and magnify himself above every god, and shall speak marvelous things against the god of gods, and shall prosper till the indignation be accomplished. For that that is determined shall be done. He's going to do according to his will. He's going to exalt himself. He's going to magnify himself above every god. This is the characteristics of the papal power. But this is Uriah Smith. Daniel Revelation 293. You need the Pioneer CD-ROM to get this, or you need to have one of the original publications because this part in the newer Daniel Revelations isn't there. This is where he's dealing with this verse. It says, the king here to introduce cannot denote the same power which was last noticed, namely the papal power, for the specifications will not hold good if applied to that power. Let's back up for just a second. Does the papacy do according to its own will? Does it exalt himself? Does he magnify himself above every god? I don't follow that reasoning. It can't, the specifications will not hold if applied to that power, but in any case... Take the de a dec declaration in the next verse. So he's jumping out of the next verse, into the next verse. Nor regard any God. This has never been true of the papacy. God and Christ, though often placed in false position, have never been professedly set aside and rejected from that system of religion. The only difficulty in, in applying it to a new power lies in the definite article, the. He's going to go after the. What, when I say he's going to go after the, what's he going to go after the? He's going to go after the word of God. Because the word of God says the, and he's going to change it. For it is urged the expression the king would identify this as one last, the one la as one last spoken of. If it could be pr properly translated a king, there would be no difficulty. And it is said that some of the best Bible critics give it this rendering. Brothers and sisters, the and a, small words, they make all the difference in the world. What, what Uriah Smith is saying is correct. If verse 36 is the king, then it has to be the king of the previous verse. But if it's a king, then you can have an excuse to jump off and introduce a new power. But the Bible says the king. 
One small word sent him down that track. And the point is, is the characteristics do hold true. Many Bible commentators will tell you that 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 3 and 4 are Paul's paraphrasing of verse 36 of Daniel 11. And this is, this is the passage in the Bible almost everyone knows is talking about the paper. It says, let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come except there comes a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Sister White, Great Controversy, page 50. This compromise between paganism and Christianity resulted in the development of the man of sin foretold in prophecy as opposing and exalting himself above God. That gigantic system of false religion is a masterpiece of Satan's power, a monument of his efforts to seat himself upon the throne to rule the earth according to his will. The characteristics of verse 36 do identify the papacy, and it does say the king, and you don't find any other place in the following verses leading up to verse 40 for justifying introducing a new power. The power from verse 31 onward is the papal power. So in verse 40, when it says, and at the time of the end, um, now this is from a word to a little flock. I have taught on tape, unfortunately, for a long time that... Uh, the author of The Word to the Little Flock was James and Ellen White, but I, when I went in to put this on PowerPoint and I looked closely, Joseph Bates helped on this too. And because of that, it is not considered inspired because they don't know which part Joseph and James and Ellen wrote. But nevertheless, this is the first publication after the Great Disappointment. So this is foundational understanding. That's the point I'm trying to make here. It says, Michael is to stand up at that time that the last power in Daniel 11, chapter 11, the king of the north. Daniel is to stand up when the king of the north comes to his end and none to help him. This power is the last that treads down the church of God and as the true church is still trodden down and cast out by all Christendom, it follows that the last oppressive power has not come to his end and Michael has not stood up. The last power that treads down the saints is brought to view in Revelation 13, 11 through 8. His number is 666. James and Ellen White. Point is, the, the beast is image, the papal power, as the king of the north, was understood right from the foundation of Adventism. And when James White was, was setting in the Dime Tabernacle in Battle Creek, I think, Battle Creek, what's this, Battle Creek, Michigan? And for the first time, Uriah Smith got up front and he was going to do a sermon on his new understanding of the King of the North. And he gave a sermon on the King of the North, Uriah Smith did, and he taught the King of the North was Turkey. And the sermon was over. What do you do when the sermon's over? You have a prayer and you break up, walk out the front? That's not what happened. James White walk, walked right up to the pulpit and you know what he did? He gave a sermon on why the King of the North is the papacy. I didn't hear that, and I don't want to hear that. <laughs> Brother and sister, James White was under conviction that a foundational truth of Adventism had just been attacked, and he caught up in the pulpit and tried to keep the foundational truth straight, and Ellen White rebuked him. She didn't rebuke him for his position on who the King of the North was. She rebuked him for going public on a disagreement. But for many years thereafter, James White and Uriah Smith had an argument about who was the King of the North. So this, this is part of Advent history that I wanted to place into this particular video. But brothers and sisters, the time of the end in verse 40 of Daniel 11 tells you who the King of the South is and when this verse starts without even looking at the spirit of prophecy. Shall we pray? <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we thank you for such a simple understanding in the book of Daniel that allows us to come to understand these truths in a convincing and complete way. We thank you for the history of Adventism um, that builds our, our understanding further. And we thank you for the time that we have to draw aside from each of our different occupations and come together and study these things. And Lord, uh, we ask that you'd continue to guide and direct in this prophecy school Bless us with light that would awaken and arouse us and 
uh, fill our quivers that we might go out and carry this message to the world. We ask that if uh, we've stumbled or failed you in any way this day or this week that you'd forgive us and continue to um, be with these meetings in a powerful way. And uh, we ask that all that we do here will be for your glory and honor in Jesus' name. Amen.